Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Maria Langworthy from Microsoft Education. I uh, work on research, and I'm actually on the product engineering side, so looking after um, what should our next generation of education products and solutions be. And that got me interested in this area and also introduced to all these wonderful people on our panel today. And um, I think we'll have a rich discussion. We're going to do our best to make it fierce, but we're not very... Um, insulting people to each other. So I think we'll have a trouble like contradicting each other. So that's up to you. After we get through our questions, questions are over to you. Be sure and um, point out the flaws in our argument, please. All right, over to Aaron first to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the project that we're all embarked on together and why Wisconsin got interested in it. Okay, thanks Maria. Um, my name is Aaron Brower. I'm the executive director for U University of Wisconsin uh, Extended Campus. And UW Extended Campus does the online programming. We're sort of like, but my colleagues hate me to say this, sort of like the in-house OPM for the uh, UW campuses. And the, uh, I could tell you more about why they hate that, but it's, it really is building capacity uh, with our partners across the whole UW. Um, this project is a way for us to, it's a proof of concept project funded through uh, Walmart Foundation. Um, and it's, uh, it's a proof of concept project to try and take uh, tools that are uh, largely within um, LinkedIn and uh, Microsoft um, to do m more uh, uh, scalable, quick, quick to market, customized and semi-customized training for businesses uh, that we partner with. So the project works in that we'll use data analytic tools to identify um, high demand areas where there are gaps in skills, the hardest areas to, to that our local region and state of Wisconsin are um, uh, have identified. Um, identify the industries, the industry sector, and then also individual actual businesses in the state and in the region who are having a hard time hiring. Go to them, say, here's the skills that we identify, have them fine-tuned with the business partnership relationship, and develop uh, skills inventories. Then we use content that we're trying to use as much as possible, repurposed content. So content that we have in our programs, LinkedIn Learning, uh, Microsoft Learn. Um, Legoize the content, pull it together into a curriculum, uh, run students through that curriculum, uh, support them through a scalable coaching model, uh, and then deliver them to employers, the same employers that we're partnering with, saying, you know, this is what you said you wanted. Here they are, well-trained. Um, and then there's, there's uh, other pieces of that, of course, as well. They're, we're also uh, trying to generate a, uh, a, uh, a comprehensive learner record as part of this approach as well. There's really a lot of both people and technology components throughout this, which I think we'll end up talking more about. Um, and the last thing I guess I want to say is this is a pull approach rather than a push approach. We're trying to take um, uh, the information from employers, uh, generate the, um, the customized training uh, uh, and education packets from them, and essentially pull people through that training in order to have that uh, specific um, employer focus at the back end. Different from doing market analysis, identifying um, uh, training, and basically push people through it and out into the world and hope they get a job. So it's, it's really kind of this pull approach and we'll see how well it works. Thanks, Aaron. Great, great story. And we've been talking for almost years now uh, about how to make something like this happen. And it's a partnership, right? And uh, the private sector is partnering in this, LinkedIn representing that. Jake, can you talk about who you are and how LinkedIn um, is interested in this? Happy to. Uh, this is probably one of the most exciting projects I've ever done at LinkedIn. And it comes at a bit of a bizarre time in my career at LinkedIn because I used to be on the higher ed team. And I'm grateful for a few folks in the audience who, who are on that team. So the team that works uh, on behalf of LinkedIn with higher education institutions. 
But at the same time, these days, I spend most of my time on workforce development. So I, I spend most of my time building public-private partnerships wherein government partners with LinkedIn to purchase our products and then help get unemployed folks jobs via those products. And this is sort of right at the intersection of those two things. It's also at the intersection of a variety of other ways that LinkedIn is working with higher ed. So as an example, that pull approach, that employer-led approach, is something we're uniquely placed to help with. More employers post jobs on our platform than anywhere else, and those jobs and what's on people's profiles produces a very rich data set to help inform higher ed on how to build curriculums, on how to support students, how to do career development, et cetera. And so that's the pull approach, but then our content's also another big part. I think Aaron's team recognized early on something that post-secondaries across this country need to learn, which is they shouldn't be making their own content all the time. Some content, every institution is probably better at producing than anyone else, but the vast majority of Economics 101 content shouldn't be duplicated by every community college or university in the country. And so the ability to, as you said, Legoize or piece together different content from Microsoft, from LinkedIn, from Open Education Resources, and from the University of Wisconsin is something that I'm really excited about here as well. And then finally, I've got a bit of a weird background in the sense that I was a public international lawyer and founded Canada's largest boot camp before joining LinkedIn. And in those two roles, a lot of what we were looking at is exactly what we started with, public-private partnerships. And so part of what I'm trying to do now is figure out how does LinkedIn, how does Microsoft, our parent company, play a role in building relationships with government, with the public sector, with higher education institutions that are mutually beneficial. There are ways to make those relationships symbiotic, and I keep calling out my favorite theorist on this, a woman named Mariano Mazzucato out of University of College London, who's really coming up with new models wherein the private sector supports the public sector, and the two actually support each other in the long term, as opposed to some of the more sort of parasitic relationships that I think uh, PPPs are infamous for. Okay, that was Mariana Mazzucato. Thank you. It's a really, really good uh, set of books. Um, I'll just add to that for a moment on the Microsoft side. Um, this whole thing got started because uh, the former governor, Tommy Thompson, um, who's now the chancellor of the University of Wisconsin State System, called Satya Nadella, our Microsoft CEO, because he was a graduate of that system. Somehow that made its way down to me with uh, Tommy saying, we, we, we want to do something big for learning adults and with Microsoft and LinkedIn. So that got pushed down to me and the conversation got started, but Microsoft obviously is a tech giant and um, we have a role to play in helping to accelerate the transformation of education systems globally. We have to be very, very careful about what role we should play and how we should do that. Um, we've got technologies like new verified credential services. We've got many platforms like Teams which we can use for the virtual front-end classroom. But how should we play in this space most responsibly? And we can't do that sitting in a box in Redmond. We need to have partnerships like these to understand the role we should play. So we're very invested in this from a learning perspective and open to learning with more partners um, just to figure out like how we can really accelerate the, the sector. Maybe, can I jump in just for one more thing because I forgot something important. And with Sean on the stage, I feel like I've got to mention it. There's a big transformation happening at LinkedIn and we've been talking a lot about it in the past few weeks, but we were a company that was all about degrees and years of experience and who you know. That's like what LinkedIn's about. And yet recently we've realized that in order to fix a variety of problems with our economy or labor market, both from an efficiency perspective and from an equity perspective, we need to look at people in terms of their skills, not just their degrees, not just their years of experience. We have to hire people based on what they are capable of, what they, not just what they've done in the past, but what they're able to do in the future. And I think as our company makes that transformation, experiments like this are really important because this is when, you know, the three of us are writing a paper on this subject right now, but this is when that academic idea of skills-based hiring or of skills-based teaching and learning gets transformed into practice. And that's the only time we're going to be able to see whether this sort of big highfalutin idea is actually going to create more equity. And the last thing I'll say specific to Sean's work with us relates to learning and employment records. And this is an area where I am personally involved. I should say that LinkedIn is not actively involved right now. But I do think this idea of individuals owning their own data in the form of a wallet or a learning and employment record could be revolutionary for how in the future people operate and in terms of their employment and their education.
Thanks, and a great segue to Sean about why Walmart was interested in this project and, and um, how you conceptualize the project. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a thank you all for, for being here today and, and listening to us up here, and I appreciate having my, just in case I forget my title, I've got it right here, so that's helpful. <laughs> but um, one clarity I do want to say, and if you could all make sure my legal um, here's this, is that um, the, the funding that enabled this work to happen is actually through Walmart and not the foundation, no worries, but our legal actually cares. Um, so please make sure they hear that. But as getting to the actual question here, so Sean Murphy, director uh, at Walmart um, on walmart.org, uh, and I'm specifically on the opportunity team. You know, I, I think as you think about Walmart as a company, many of you know who we are. We're a retailer, right? We're a tech company. We're all the things. Um, and you, you recognize that we have 1.5 million associates across the U.S. We've got like 2.5 globally. Um, and, you know, so when we think about the work we're doing philanthropically, um, we always have that group in mind, right? We always have that adult learner, that adult worker, um, in mind and who we're serving and, and you know what's so important and what we recognize about those associates and ultimately the future associates and those that have been associates in the past and everybody else in that in that ecosystem um, is that you know life happens not every not everyone what is it 32.5 percent of the population has a degree that means a whole lot of folks don't right and that means that we need to think about pathways um, not just in how do you become a nurse and then a doctor, but pathways in how do you learn. And, and what we know from our associates is that you have to bring learning to them and you have to do it where they're at. And you have to be able to show and be able to understand how you can move in a career um, like so many do um, in ways that really provide opportunity for all. Thinking about how do you remove bias, how do you give true opportunity, um, how do you not overwhelm people at the same time with information, but how do you um, give them access to their records in a way that they can really understand what's possible? And so when we think about the work that we're doing um, around learning and employment records and skills, I think one of the things that's so important as we think about skills is that we already have a skill-based economy. It's just what I just said, we don't recognize most of the skills that people have. Um, and so, you know, recently I'd had this conversation with folks on what does it mean to build a skill-based system? We have one. <laughs> but how do we build the infrastructure needed to ultimately recognize as many skills as possible in whatever form you learned it in? And I think it's a key part to recognize is that some people have said, well, but, you know, I think the degree system is the way to go. It's not about degrees versus skills. Skills is just the language that ultimately crosses all forms of learning and employment. That's what we're talking about. But when we talk about that, we're exponentially growing the amount of data that you now have to maintain and use and make available all the things, right? And that's where we think about the learning and employment record system, is that underlying utility that has to be built that allows for an individual to take their records, an interoperable learning and employment record system that allows you to move your records wherever necessary and leverage all the tools and all the cool things that'll be built off of that um, and truly get to a space that it's, in a lot of ways, I would say some of my colleagues may not agree or other folks may not say that we talk about this being a supply problem in our, in our world right now around workforce. I would suggest it's not a supply problem, it's a matching problem. We're not matching people to the right roles and we're not even aware, you know, we don't even really know internally um, within most of the employers around what talent we have internally, let alone what's available externally. So how can we say that the supply is not there when we can't even match the talent we have? And so that brings me to this project, right? Is this project is really exciting in the fact that you have the stakeholders that are playing in this that are engaging and really getting, getting dirty in the process of learning what's working, what's not, um, and really thinking about the full continuum, all the way from learning to employment. Now maybe that's starting from somebody going right into school in what we call traditional, right? Coming from K-12 right into higher ed, or maybe that's somebody returning after having a job or losing a job or whatever it might be, and getting skills, getting reskilled, getting skills, and ultimately moving into employment. And that's where, as I think about this project, 
and when it was brought to our attention as an opportunity um, is that it was really that the group has been thinking about all the way from that place of learning all the way into employment. And that means you have to think about the, the learning provider, you have to think about the user and the worker learner, and you need to think about the employers. Thanks, Sean. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And yes, we're going to get dirty <laughs> through this process. Certainly Jake and I uh, getting immersed in it. And um, But it is so true that you have to get there to really understand, you know, user story by user story by user story throughout the entire flow, like what does it take to make people succeed through the entire journey? And what supports do they need at each stage? And you know, what kind of partnership do you really have to legitimately get rolling on the ground with your employer partners to make sure that there's a, a, a good solid landing for the learners? So with that and the sort of larger ecosystem, Jeannie, if you could introduce yourself and, and the way you perceive projects like these. Hello, everyone. Jeannie Kitchens, uh, Chief Technology Services Officer with Credential Engine. Uh, first, let me say we're a nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> we're not a, you know, a tech startup selling software or anything like that. But I'm probably in the middle here because we're open national infrastructure. And what we want to do is be able to work with projects like this one and others. As a matter of fact, after this, I have a workshop upstairs with Education Design Labs doing similar kind of work where this valuable information that comes from this um, and the, the training, the modulization of the training, the credentials that are ultimately going to be awarded to the persons that go through this and the pathways that they're progressing through all need to be transparent linked open data and in a way that we can have it out there on the web, you know, for everyone to consume. And um, in the case of Credential Engine, we have um, technologies that are open for anyone to use to convert information into human, important human understandable information that is also uh, linked open data that can open up all kinds of possibilities and how you can use this valuable information to help people, to help the faculty, to help the employers, to help the students and the, you know, the workers, to better understand, be more transparent, comparable, and understand what it is they're progressing through, what it ultimately will lead to, and how can they get there, and what does it all look like? Great, great. Can I jump in with a couple thoughts? One was somebody yesterday told me a line that I never heard before that I, I liked and it related to what Sean was saying in terms of the skills being out there, the supply being there, it's just not being matched correctly. And in particular, the line was, the world's not that small. And it was in response to a bunch of folks I know from Toronto just like randomly running into each other at this conference. Rather, it's poorly mixed. And I think that's a very accurate description of why so much privilege is so concentrated all of us are here because we're part of this community that is poorly mixed. And the 30% of America that's never been close to a higher education institution is part of a very different community that's not very well mixed. And so to the extent that I think we can mix and match better, um, I'm excited about a more equitable and efficient future in that respect. Similarly, in terms of the role of Credential Engine, people usually cite your report of having you know, a million credentials in America. And I'm pretty sure that's how like, most of the world knows about Credential Engine outside of our really internecine community of like, open labor market information, et cetera. But interestingly, they cite it to suggest that there's too many credentials and we don't know what they mean. And, we don't... and the irony of that is your goal is to make them more comprehensible, right? To allow an individual to figure out what program should I take? What school should I go to? What online learning program should I take? Yeah, and, and I think there's going to be more because <clears throat> of the fact that um, degrees are becoming unbundled into smaller pieces, micro-credentials, right? So you can have these pathways to success that may lead to, you know, a, a degree of some sort, you know, or not, depending on the person's, you know, goals. So um, if anything, probably the number will continue uh, to rise. But yeah, I'm sure there are people who are thinking, wow, that's way too many. <laughs> That's way too many credentials out there, but it is, it is what it is. There, that is what is out there. We have you know, every credential from every post-secondary institution or individual certification body or training provider, whatever it is, is unique, is different. 
And so we have to better understand what, unpack it, what is it? <laughs> you know, how can we um, better understand this information? Again, is that very valuable information that we should all have? I mean, we can go on Google and we could Google a pizza, right? And we can find all the locations near us and compare them very easily and have it delivered to us probably within 15 minutes right here in this room. Um, but we still can't do that for credentials or competencies or skills and so forth. So we all have to do a better job with that. It's really helped make that more transparent. Thanks, thanks, Jeannie. Yeah, I mean, um, w the changes in digital transformation on the consumer realm have just so far outpaced the education sector that I think, in the in a way, the pandemic has su shown such shown such a light on that that it's forced. Um, a different reckoning and a different um, dialogue between the public and the private sector. Um, I can say from personal experience, the tone of the conversation that we have with ministries of education, with UNESCO's, with higher education institutions, radically shifted within weeks of the pandemic starting. And, and that shift in the language and the tone and the openness to real partnership has really been helpful, I think, for learning on both sides. Um, before, I think there was some distrust on the side of higher ed and many education institutions. And there was also, I would say, a naive optimism on the part of many technology companies and ed tech providers about, oh, you know, we can sell this stuff, it'll be great, and it'll solve all your problems. It's a lot more complex. And uh, so with that, let's turn to the question of public-private partnerships, you know, these things have been talked about, but what do they really mean, and why are they important, and what do you think it takes to make something like this, you know, successful, you know, in our relationship? Yeah. Aaron, I'm going to look to you first. Um, so, one of the interesting things here is, this is the first, we've been working together for a couple years, first time I'm seeing these folks face to face. So, you know, let's just recognize how different the world is. Um, from uh, the before time. Um, so I, you know, you kind of stole this, the line that I was gonna say about the uh, sort of distrust on one side and over-optimism on the other, but it's, it's really true, and I think this dialogue is a different one between, um, uh, I'm gonna take this question not so much public-private as inside higher education and outside higher education, um, a colleague and I are, um, are editing a book. Uh, about half of the chapters are from people inside higher ed and half the people are outside. A great chapter by uh, Maria and Jake. Um, the book is focused on future of higher ed that is this mix and match, uh, lifelong learning model, um, uh, learner agency, you know, and how do we lean into this to make it a better uh, experience for students? for people um, throughout their lives. The, the interesting thing is the people who are writing from outside higher ed see that future as sort of like a optimized version of Amazon Marketplace. And the people inside higher ed see it as like an optimized, better version of what classrooms are right now, virtual or not. Um, and of course the answer is both. Um, it really is both. It's, got to be a combination of using technology in a way that really provides access and scale, and then uh, relationships that come from people dealing with each other in a direct way. Um, so in some ways, I think that's what is really fundamentally uh, important to this project, is trying to really uh, merge the technology and the human um, parts of this project all the way through um, to really get to the outcomes that we need to. Uh, one last thing is, um, so coming from inside higher ed, and I, ha I, I hate to say it, but like almost 40 years in uh, this field, um, I'm an incrementalist, so I think change is going to be like little bits of projects that work well going forward. So I'm always amazed at the next big thing that technology sends out there, and this is gonna be it now, and, um, and sometimes that's true. Uh, but I, what I also am excited about this is we're, we're really trying to get this done, right? It's not just the concept of bringing technology in, but it's really uh, uh, bringing it uh, to a place where, the, 
where individuals can really get jobs. And it's really something that is a value for employers and the people that are going through. And if we can do that, this is going to, you know, this will be great. Cool, cool, thank you. Um, and anybody else want to take the question on public private? I think there's a couple of different ways of viewing it. One of them is like, how do you use public funding to do private things or to do things with post secondaries? Uh, I come from a country where almost all post secondaries, I'm Canadian, are publicly funded, and it results in a really different dynamic in terms of how post secondaries decide to teach, what they teach, who they work with on the employer side, et cetera. But as an example, it actually makes it harder in Canada for schools to work with employers because they don't feel the need. They're already paid for. Somebody else is paying for it. And over the past couple of years, work-integrated learning, work-based learning has become a huge push in Canada. Why? In part because it does what LinkedIn does, which is connect employers to students because they need that real-world experience. And then it's doing it, in many cases, via higher ed institutions. So there's literally like a dozen startups to middle stage companies here that all do different versions of work-based learning automatically, i.e. Uh, one of my favorite ones from Canada, of course, is called Ripen. And what they do is they work in a classroom and when a faculty member, let's say, needs to spin up 500 projects for all of their marketing students to ensure that they have some real world experience, it matches them to companies who are looking for the skills those students have and then they start working on small projects with those companies. And at the same time, there's usually a gap, right? What the given company needs in terms of skills is different than what the students are learning in that class. So they will then provide us a list of those skills. We'll map LinkedIn learning courses to those skills. And then you'll have that combination of the unique education that that institution is providing, the real world experience of a project with a company that maybe that student could later on work with or at least have on their resume or LinkedIn profile, and some content off the shelf provided by us that is really specific to that project. And so that kind of example, and there are many, many others, whether in work-based learning or, for instance, in the budding field of skills-based learning, that I think demonstrate the power of a public-private partnership. The other side here, to carry on with the idea of sort of humanity plus technology, is I think we need to emphasize the role of the actual people doing career coaching, doing career development far, far more. Every student in a post-secondary should at some point interact with a human being who can help them either with trying to figure out what future career, what future education they want or need. And we're not talking in a batch loaded way. I mean, over their entire educational career, we should all be going back and forth. You know, right now, career coaches are a huge in even the private sector, but we don't really see a role for higher ed in that. And I think if it was a constant rotation of individuals in and out of educational institutions with career coaching for those facing barriers, maybe with other supports to get them through the social determinants of educational success, then I think we'll end up with a way more productive higher education system. But we can't continue to devalue roles like career coaches in higher education institutions relative to, for instance, professors. Great, great. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, I mean, I, I think this highlights one of the reasons that we got excited about this body of work that this group is working on is that in public-private partnerships, and I think we've all seen it, where you'll still only have pieces of the ball game, right? Um, in this case, there's really a thoughtful approach to, it's a public-private partnership, but it's including the educational institution, it's including the students, and it's including the employer side. And I, I think that's really key. If you look at all of the projects that we're funding from a demonstration standpoint in this world, all of them, or at least a vast majority of them, um, are going to include kind of all of those legs, right? There's work in Indiana, there's work in North Dakota, there's work elsewhere that we're either evaluating or funding now, and all of them are really including all of those pieces, um, because if we're not including all of those pieces, this is going to fall down, right? This whole ecosystem will fall down unless you're including all aspects of the of the. And that's part of why I think there haven't been very strong proof points of demonstrations of this is because it's been piecemeal or there haven't been the holistic end-to-end -end scenario that, that we'll aim for. We may not achieve it, but we'll research it really, really yeah, well. We will, we will achieve it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully in V1, but if within not in V2. Yeah. Within a year. <laughs> yeah. Jeannie, did you want to say anything about uh, public-private? Because we can take questions from the audience too. Get ready. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, just building on top of what everybody was saying, those are all, you know, the, 
the, the value of the pu public-private partnerships and building the bridge between learning and working is an essential component that we need to see you know, continuously in projects like this. It can't just be just one part of it, the, you know, the institution or just the private sector company and you know, bringing in you know, global, globally well-known, obviously, you know, Microsoft and LinkedIn and, and, you know, higher ed is a very powerful statement in and of itself, of course. So, I mean, it's, it, it's important. And then, of course, I'm thinking about also as well, oh, I also think about a public, like, data and private, <laughs> you know, what's in a proprietary system that we'll never be able to touch and but how can we also make, have the public side of this in terms of the data aspects to make sure, again, that we really are connecting all the dots, not only bridging learning to work and bringing public and private together, but then thinking about, again, that transparency of this valuable information and how can we make sure that it's being it's out there in its public information and take advantage of, you know, infrastructure that we can share. Maybe one last point on a few examples of how we're, we're doing that overseas, and, and these are sort of ideas that I think we're pulling into this project, but LinkedIn hasn't executed on this project in particular. But as an example, we've got this thing called academic credits that we're running with, uh, primarily in Europe and a few other countries right now, wherein some educational institutions will accept LinkedIn learning courses as a means, as a funnel in essence, into their institutions. And we're seeing that people literally take our courses at twice the rate and then complete them, again, at twice the rate, if there is that four credit component at the end of the pathway. And I think offering those carrots to individuals, because we know that you know, completion rates on massive open online courses were like 2% 15 years ago. It hasn't really changed all that much, despite the techno-utopianism of the pandemic. And yet, if you add, you can get credit at a real university for, to the end of that, they double. So figuring out some of those experiments, another one we're running is called Skills Path, where the employer sets out assessments for what they think, or they use LinkedIn assessments for what they think is necessary for a given role. And if individuals are able to do well enough on those assessments, they guarantee them an interview. And that gets through a lot of the bias in the earlier parts of the recruiting process. So we're looking at ways of making the entire process more skills-based, um, which I think is part of why there's so much alignment between the work that Walmart and LinkedIn Microsoft and the University of Wisconsin in credentialing. You're building value in the currency that is skills, right? Exactly, yeah. precisely, skills as currency. And just to add on one thing to what Jean said, transparency around data, but while respecting privacy. And, you know, uh, and so we, we have to get the balance right between permission to use data and people's interest in sharing their data. So questions from the audience here. Anybody got some provocative po I've got lots more questions for this group, but if anybody out there, yeah, yeah. I think you've been, I think you've been able to um, express uh, what the output is, or the outcome, I should say, the outcome of this project is. What do you see as output? Is it a project? Is there a technology out there that can be consumed? What do you see as the result of this project? Indeed, this is going to help a lot with the skills-driven uh, uh, job hunting and developing skills. What is the output? Great, great question. Um, I'll take it from the Microsoft side. You take it from the university side. From the Microsoft side, we have lots and lots of technologies, and we have lots of ways of extending those technologies. We need to understand um, wh how existing technologies can be used to support this model and how we need to extend them. I mean, if you think, uh, you know, just in the education sector, we have, we touch, our products touch probably 300 million students globally. And if we can figure out ways to see the acceleration of this type of model, we can, we can scale, we can have vast impact on the scale of adoption. But that's what I was saying in the beginning. We have to understand what we need to do and the appropriate way to do it. And so for us, the outcome is a requirements document for where we should go on this journey. Um. So, uh, sort of springboarding off of what Maria is saying, the technology that we now, <coughs> excuse me, that we're now using um, itself is enormously helpful to do stuff that, if people are familiar with um, 
uh, traditional continuing education contract training. This is sort of like that on steroids or supercharged and doing it through technology. Um, so that piece of it is, is really helpful. Um, I think we'll be extending the technology. One of the things at dinner that I wanted to share with uh, Jake is that there's a, a piece missing from the LinkedIn tools that we have that if we could just do this one piece, and I'm certain that the, that the tool would support it, it would just make this one piece go even further. Um, so we'll be able to you know, kind of extend the technology uh, that way. Um, there's also processes that will get systematized. So for example, uh, we're in the stage where we've identified now the skills inventories and we've identified uh, businesses that are the likely candidates that we'll partner with. Um, that process of doing that could probably be written out like a, a recipe and, um, and then you can kind of do that better and do it quicker. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. And then there'll be the products themselves. So uh, we'll generate a customized training piece and to the extent it'll have some value, we'll stick it on Credential Engine and then if people you know, buy it, it has value for other people, not just the specific um, content. And then the last piece of this is we have a, a really robust coaching model right now with the students who go through our programs. Um, it, it, and it's like retention rates for our, our programs are in the 80%, which is, as you know, double what the national average is. These are adult, you know, working adult part-time students. Um, but that's not scalable. So we've got to figure out a way to uh, change that or augment it with technology or figure out again the balance between the people and the technology. And that too will be a product that, uh, that I can envision from this. And I would just throw in, I really hope from this, I hope I learn that we learn as much what didn't work as what does work in all of this learning and employment records, skills, all of these words that I could throw out um, is what doesn't work or what more needs to happen to make those kind of systems actually scalable and not just some cute pilots. Yeah, I, I think learning is really the most important part of this for me personally. Like these are experiments and we're gonna do them in the open, which is sort of rare, I think, between higher ed and big companies like ours. But hopefully we'll learn whether matching people to education and then jobs this way is more equitable or not. You know, there's only 50 people to start, but we're gonna check out what their demographics are with their permission, of course, and then figure out, do they end up in jobs at a different rate or do they stay in those jobs for a longer period than folks who go through more traditional or less traditional programs? We, we have the next proposal already ready for you, Sean. <laughs> and as, as the mic is, is moving over, I mean, it could be a new business model for University of Wisconsin State System. It could be products from Microsoft and LinkedIn. We will, you know, yeah, we're companies. We'll productize. Maria, I'm wondering, what, we've what? got three questions and two minutes. So I'm yes, wondering uh, if we have all the questions. And better make it a fast answers. question, yeah. Stefan was about lecture. So I'm interested in uh, the um, uh, credentialing you mentioned, like getting academic credits and how that works. Like, is it just a multiple choice assessment? Do you validate who the learner is? Because it could be the mom, could be the brother. You know, I was just curious how picky the university is on that and, and how, how, how open... Uh, uh, doors uh, you have found there or not. And then curious, you know, once you get the university to recognize that, well, once you've got enough skills and assessments, you know, maybe the employer will say, hey, I'll recognize that, I don't need the university anymore. So just wondering where you see this going. You know, I mean, I think one of the things is that, and you'll see in an upcoming report coming out from SHRM, um, that employers want to hire in different ways. They want to hire people based on short-term credentials and other pathways, they will continue hiring based on degrees. Um, but that the way the current systems are set up, they and there's a lot more to the report that I'm gonna read off, but one of the key things is there's still a lack of understanding of quality. There's still a lack of understanding in what you learn in short-term credential, how does that compare to a degree path? Um, and so I think as we think about not just short-term credentials, but any path for learning, um, how do we make that information more transparent and available so that way systems can be put in place for employers especially to be able to evaluate. But I would also say back to the higher ed system, how can the higher ed system evaluate skills that are being learned and other mechanisms to ultimately move folks through um, the type of training that they need to do to stay um, up with you know, the world in which we live today. 
Apologies, three seconds left. So uh, state your question, please, and then we'll take it up, uh, either up here or, or move outside. And other questions, too, we're happy to continue. So uh, are you letting um, uh, small ed tech companies also join in this project? I mean, I guess in some ways you're a small ed tech nonprofit, but. Is that geared toward me? Oh, okay, sorry, I, did, I couldn't quite hear the. Are, are small ed tech companies joining this project? Not as of yet. I don't think. Yeah. If, if you're talking, we have a medium-sized one involved. Yeah. <laughs> if you're talking about the project as a whole, um, I think it's probably kind of a, a set group of players. But with Credential Engine, any um, ed tech platforms that want to, um, you know, work with us, we're we're available for that. So yeah. And I'd say from the Microsoft side, we operate with an ecosystem of technical partners, SIs, ISVs. And so we'll be looking for ways to plug in our, our partner ecosystem into projects like these. So, but let's talk some more. But this, one, this project itself is accepting uh, s small players or? It, the project is what it is right now, but th it's proof of concept. So the idea is that it should grow. So we should talk afterwards. <laughs> hey, thanks everybody on the panel. This has been fun. And, uh,